Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome back to YCR's Food for Thought series. For those of you who are just seeing YCR for the first time, I am Justice Otto. Uh, I am a finance graduate from the University of Alberta, uh, and with me is Hannah and Miles. We are part of Young Canadians for Resources. We are an advocacy group made by students and young professionals for students and young professionals who believe that Canada can have a strong future in resources, the economy, and the environment. So I'll just allow uh, Hannah and Miles to introduce themselves real quick. Perfect, thank you so much, Justice. Uh, my name is Hannah, I'm a third year student at U of C in Natural Science, and I've been with YCR for uh, coming up on two years now, and I'm super excited to see Jay's presentation today. Thanks, Justice. Uh, hey, Jay. I'm Miles. I'm a fourth year student in political science at the University of Calgary and uh, also excited to hear your presentation today. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, so today, uh, as we said, we're pleased to welcome back Jay Wusari. Um, Jay is an environmental and agricultural professional scientist with over 34 years of experience in addressing environmental challenges. Uh, this includes land and wetland reclamation, environmental remediation, ecological restoration, revegetation of disturbed habitats, and much more. Jay is also an expert in leading multifaceted projects in the resource extraction and agricultural sectors. Jay is working on developing an Indigenous land stewardship and entrepreneurship program to inspire Indigenous youth in becoming stewards of their land, pursuing further education and obtaining meaningful employment. In addition, Jay is also incredibly well versed in areas such as processes to enhance reclamation and remediation practices and program development. He has also served as a subject matter expert to extract key environmental knowledge and information and translate that into valued information to aid with informed decision making. This barely begins to scratch the surface on Jay's large depth of knowledge, achievements and imperative roles across a variety of sectors. Some of these roles include work in the Alberta Innovates Technology Futures, working as president of the Wusari Environmental Incorporated, and his current role as an Indigenous training advisor at Ridgeline Canada. Um, before I let Jay take it away with his amazing presentation, I would just like to remind our audience that they can ask questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A box below. Also, please feel free to connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn at YC Resources if you want to learn more about what we do. Um, so without further ado, Jay, uh, take it away and feel free to share your screen again. <laughs> Thank you so much, Justice. Uh, I'm just trying to share my screen again. Uh, let me know, like, uh, first I would like to say a few words about uh, Ambipo Response, like uh, who, who we are. Basically, we are originally in Canada, but last September, uh, Ambipo Response, which is one of our largest environmental company out of Brazil, acquired Richline Canada and a few other companies in Canada. So slowly we're on the transition right now and eventually will be known as Ambipo Response. So as such, I will just use this session to just have two slides on us. Uh, because we are new in Canada now. So Ampipo uh, operates in over 39 countries, six continents, and we have about 400 officers throughout uh, the world. So our goal is simply help uh, different companies take care of the planet, because as we know it, we have no planet B, so how best to take care of planet E. So I move to the next slide. Uh, my PowerPoint presentation is not working, so I'm using my PDF. Uh, this is just some of the main areas we are working, uh, from emergency, emergency response to marine response, to fire, to medical, industrial, and environmental. And the next slide will show you all the services we provided. Like, uh, it's just so detailed, like uh, we have uh, different categories under each of them. I'm not going to go through that. I just put it there for just to give you an idea of the diverse experiences that we bring to different companies. So I will leave it there and the presentation you will have so you can look at it later. So for my presentation, I was asked to talk about agriculture and I just put it, I copied that from your own website about, you know, like what I want to talk about. 
And basically, one of your objective is to inform uh, young Canadians about the world leading resources. And of course, agriculture by itself, it won't exist. Exists. We need energy, we need uh, everything else to make it work. And of course, when we think about agriculture, uh, I don't know what you guys think. I think of food, what comes first to mind. So we are used to our traditional. Uh, we have food like, you know, the kitchen, the food comes to the table and so on. And we have a happy life, hopefully. But we have many challenges on our way now. And I will go through some of the histories, uh, how I, what is agriculture, how it uh, started, and some of the challenges we face uh, in the past. And yet we still to do uh, certain things the same way. And how we're moving away, we are learning at the same time. So for agriculture, for us, when we think of food, we just go to, to the supermarket. And so far, you guys see my slides all right, right? Good. So we just go to the market. We just pick whatever groceries we want or we can afford, especially, especially these days. And we just come home. But how it all originates, you know, like uh, what does agriculture mean to us? So I hope to provide you an understanding of agriculture. So basically, agriculture by definition is the science and heart of cultivating the soil, producing crops, raising livestock, uh, and also marketing because like when we are more, we give to our neighbors or we sell them and we get something else, right? There are many definitions. We talk about agriculture as a science and occupation of cultivating the soil, producing crop, crop and raising livestock and so on. So the definition of air, just to give us like, you know, what do we mean by agriculture? It's not only food, but there's also livestock, there's foragers, there's agroforestry because we need uh, uh, like trees for fiber, trees for fuel. So there's lots of things when we talk about agriculture. And of course, I did not talk about greenhouses and uh, uh, <clears throat> micro farming, uh, vertical farming, and so on, which is nowadays more into the building. So uh, this is just like <clears throat> it's coming more and more popular. I'm just st sticking to the base of agriculture. So we, well, we talk about definition again, like, you know, food. Of course, I love eating. If you are like me, love eating, you would like agriculture. So, it means fiber, shelter, fuel, and of course, energy. Energy, like in terms of uh, oil and gas, to heat the homes, heat the barns, or whatever, drive the grains, uh, fuel the tractor. So it takes energy, and we have to be mindful where that energy comes from. Fiber, all of us need fiber. We need shelter to construct our homes. Uh, agriculture has a lot to do. Today, even from then, how agriculture starts, we think of subsistence, but people used to gather things, you know, to go about their daily lives. Today, we are geared more towards a commercial approach where we have commercial growers, but in Canada, we have many family farms that still exist, although the number of farms have been shrinking because, like, as a young one leaves the farm and go up and move to towns and cities and so on, and it's hard to attract people to, to farming. So, that's why we move more towards commercial agriculture, but subsistence farming in terms of family farm and so on, and in other countries, small farms is really used. So how does agriculture start? Over centuries, uh, growth of agriculture contributed, contributed to civilization. Like I said, it started uh, by evidence about some 12,000 years ago, but we start to learn how to grow cereal crops, and settle down a life based on farming. Then during the 15th century, explorers come, we start to find new varieties. What else to grow? Like what makes the land better? So we start to find uh, coffee and dyes for clothing and so on. And we start to grow many crops, like with the settlers coming in, we start to grow like potatoes, tomatoes, corn, maize, and so on. And some of those crops like corn and maize and so on were grown by indigenous people prior to a revolution of settlers. So by 1700, we start to see inventions, inventions in terms of machinery, and machinery turned agriculture 
like really make agriculture fun. And from this picture, just some of our old equipment, like agricultural equipment, I take a shot of when I was visiting the, there was, there's an old soil slab by Agriculture Canada in Riverville. So when I was passing by, I said, hey, I got to do the presentation. So stop by, take a shot of some of our equipment, but there's no room to store. So just put outside to us, I guess, to show and expose to the elements. But uh, this is how agriculture, agriculture started to expand in North America. Uh, we saw the early part of the revolution, like, you know, we see great leaps in invention, mechanical innovation. And also many of the farmers uh, that start to expand our agriculture when they settle in the West. Many of them did not understand the climate, the soils, and they have to basically by trial and error and they learn what, what varieties were best and so on. Their area, their climate. So agriculture keep on growing. And of course, to go back again before the, the Indian people used to be growing crops, like, uh, for example, like uh, beans, corn, or as we say, maize, squash, and so on. So it exists prior to our of settlers. But what we learned from that, that agriculture keeps on booming. And uh, many of, of you know, like nowadays, the indigenous way of planting, of farming, where we call the three sisters or four sisters of planting. Uh, I don't know. Hopefully you guys are familiar, but basically when you plant one plant, like uh, the vines, like the squash, will use the corn as support, and uh, the squash will provide the, will provide the surface of the soil, will provide it with moisture and things like that. So that's the principles of the uh, indigenous way of planting. And also the fourth crop, you know, we all, through our time we say three sisters, but some indigenous people refer to the four sisters. And the four sisters are some flowers like uh, bergamot, for example, which is found all over the great plains and so on. And they use that to attract the bees. And of course, you know, it's like deja vu. Today, bees is a big part of pollination. And with the decrease in biodiversity, we are trying to have projects where we can enhance uh, bee pollination. So our ancestors have some of those knowledge. We tend to move away and forget about it. And uh, so it's good, like, you know, say, oh, geez, we know that, right? So if you look at the slide, like, you know, like I said, the indigenous way of planting with the sisters, uh, sister bean fixers and make uh, available in platform nitrogen, because bean is a legume, it fixes nitrogen, and corn provides support for the sister bean, and sister squash provides cover to moisture. And if you think about regeneration farming, which I will talk a little bit later, those principles are important to this day because we move away from these principles. I felt check span and resulted in many problems. But at some time, now it's good to look back at history, how things used to be done, and how can we, you know, resolve some of the problems we are facing today. Uh, more than a century ago, of course, the picture just the settlers and arrival of the settlers and so on to bring their expertise, uh, especially the West. The West was settled by many settlers coming to, like, you know, to uh, increase population in Western Canada. So the federal government has a big call about like, some West, you know, and from the land to, because many uh, settlers were farming in the early days, they settled around you know, the greater Ontario area and so on. And to get people to move West, so the government was trying to say, go there, cultivate land, and, and go and so on. But I'm trying to put it in the simplest way, right? But you can go back to the link and learn more about it. So I put some links here, like, you know, the Journal of History, Ag, Ag History. You have a Canadian Museum of Agriculture. It's great to visit and where you learn lot, lot, a lot about history and agriculture in, in Canada. So I put down a couple of... Uh, Key things, you know, that impacted agriculture. Uh, I don't know many of you know the Dust Bowl or the Dirty Thirties, but I remember when I was a student at U of A, uh, uh, Grant McLuhan, the famous now, the college and the University McLuhan University, uh, he was my prof. You know, I had the pleasure to have him. What a wonderful guy. And he was always talking about, you know, his lecture on agriculture, how 
the glasses of foragers that were introduced save us from like you know the disaster uh, events. So in the in the 30s we have a great great uh, dust bowl and basically it's like dust was just blowing over and cover everything. And one of the reasons for that, other government were encouraging uh, people to come and take and break down virgin grassland and put more crops. And we did not do anything that will preserve the land, anything that will conserve the land. So in fact, when we have the wind coming, uh, the soil was exposed, and you get this giant dust bowl that just blow all over. A lot of the topsoil we lost. That's why, in, in fact, today when we see strong winds and we see farmers filled where we don't have any cover crops or we don't conserve organic matter, we saw the dust just blowing. And here in Alberta, I would say, oh no, our dust is going to Saskatchewan, you know? And it, it's just a joke, but it come, the idea comes from a dust bowl, but just all that rich organic layer that supports the crop, we are losing it. So, because many of our students nowadays are young, so they may not be, they may, they may not, or they may have hear from the family, so that's why I put it there. And of course, uh, there was a great revo uh, the green revolution. Uh, I was fortunate enough when I was a student at uh, U of A, uh, Dr. Norman Bolo was a guest lecturer. So I had to listen to him, which was great again. I, I met great people. But Norman Bolo was credited uh, for the green revolution, what he, what he thought it was. So as population, population increases, the fear or the expectations that you, are we going to have enough food to feed the world? And to this day, this is still a big question because we see like population just booming and booming. And where would all the food come from? Do we have enough uh, arable land to grow crops? And despite with technology today, like, with, like I said, we have vertical farming and so on, that is trying to help. But uh, still the question was, where would the food come? So Dr. Norman Bolo thought, like, you know, like if a plant grows taller and taller, it's putting more energy into the stems, so less into the seed production. So if you could find a variety of wheat that is shorter, uh, then there, could be, there will be more kernel of wheat per stem, and then yield will be higher. So by trying to select plants that, produce, that have more seed kernel into the stem, it will have higher hill. It was able to find varieties of wheat that can yield six times more than traditional wheat. So this brings on the, the idea of green evolution because people start to grow crops for high yield, but at the same time use a lot of fertilizers and so on, just to increase production to feed the world. So, and of course, Dr. Norman Bolo extend the idea to India and Pakistan, who at that time their population were growing and did not have enough food and lots of people were taking starvation. So Dr. Norman Bolog, I forgot what year, won the Nobel Prize in Agriculture. And uh, when he went in the world to and speak and so on. So it was a great idea, right? To have a green revolution, like we have lots of food, huge farm, and people were just uh, harvesting Lots and lots of grain for exporting. So that's why even like today, Canada is a, I think I'm on the top country uh, for the grain, wheat, and so on exporting. And there's Canada, uh, Canada, U.S., and then Ukraine, and of course the Ukrainian war, where yield has been affected so many industries. So we were great revolution, and it brought environmental challenges. Environmental challenges that. Uh, Nobody think, and I thought, you know, we think like, hey, if we have now we have plastic, for example, we can use it as uh, tunnels, we can grow crops in it, you know, it conserves the moisture, so we don't have the dust blowing away. We can get crops growing, right? And so we can start to grow vegetables. So, mulch, plastic mulch has become very common, but what nobody thinks about was when the plastic break down, what happened? Where does the plastic end up? We talk about plastic floating in the surface, in the ocean, for trying to clean. But in the soils, in agriculture, in fact, there are more plastic breaking down right underneath our feet. But we don't think about it because we're just concerned about food production. 
So there are lots of research. I put some of those reference. I use reference, but I think it's credible because I use a lot of from the uh, crops, pulls, and agro agronomy newsletter from the US. Uh, I look at the European, what they are doing. I look at Canada. So this way I pull my information. But when you look at plastics, you know, like nowadays there are lots of research because there's a huge concern where you have microplastics into our, our food. And uh, there, are lo there are lots of research to see how those plastics break down, where they end up, where we get accumulated, and what happened to our food system, how safe it is. So you can read all about it and just Google it, you will see. Uh, take, for example, like uh, England. Uh, in UK, like still, they do the same. The practice is the same because people are learning from each other. And in England too, they use the same kind of idea, use a tunnel to prevent erosion and conserve moisture and so on. And they plant into like tomatoes, cabbages, lettuce and so on in those big tools. And of course, like when one crop is done, it breaks down and so on. You have to put new plastic, the cycle goes on. Like in UK, like, you know, like there are about 45,000 tons of ag agricultural plastics produced every year. And this plus, these plastics, like, uh, they don't break down easily and they just accumulate in pile and pile and they cannot be recycled. So they just end up in the land landfill. And those plastics are broken down. They will get into the water, they get into the food system. That's why many of them are trying to study now, start to get our attention. So it's going this way. So <clears throat> that's one interesting thing. And a few years ago, about 2018, I think, yeah, 2018, uh, the U of A hosts the Bentley Lecture in Sustainable Agriculture. We had the pleasure of going there to attend uh, to see Dr. Jennifer Clark talking. And one of, one of the things about food security, you want, you want to have more food available to humans, to all of us. But sometimes you see big companies like we produce herbicides and what, what we see from the green revolution, uh, there's a, there was also an increased use of pesticides to control pests, weeds, and that's why there were lots of accumulation of like, you know, some of the toxins, they uh, tend to persist a little bit longer. So Dr. Clark was talking now how was huge, uh, what do you call that? Herbicide company are uh, getting together for conglomeration like joining forces in order to give farmers less choices. So farmers have less choices. As population grow, farmers need more seed in order to plant and so on. So by having your use conglomeration, farmers you are tying their hands pretty well. You have to go to these big companies to get your seed. So like for vegetables and so on, this is where heritage seeds come from. You can buy heritage seeds, but for big companies, some of them I know because the amount of work the search is spent in crop breeding and so on. But at the, but at the same time, uh, I don't know how right is right by forcing farmers to just buy only from you. So this was an interesting lecture. I put the video there, but I think I put the link here and you can go to the link and watch it if you want because the whole lecture is about one hour. So it's very interesting to, to see, like, you know, like we don't hear about it, but uh, some of the big companies are we are joining together uh, to put more pressure on the farmers. And of course, when this happens, price of food will go up again. So today, and uh, I'm just looking at my time, make sure, like, because I, I have about 45 slides, but hopefully I will go through all of them. Uh, today, the food crisis, uh, we talk about agriculture. Population is still growing. Uh, there's no end in population. Right now, we're about 8 billion, and we expect to be like 10 billion by 2030, something like that. And of course, it, go, it goes up and up. And the big question is how do we feed all these people? You know, do we have enough land? So, despite all that, we see like uh, with the population growth, uh, here I put some of the countries. By according to the United Nations, are going to experience the highest growth in population. And those are some of the poorest countries that already have difficulty feeding their own population. 
And uh, so this is a huge concern for United Nations. And later I will talk about some, I will not talk, but I will just mention that there are lots of countries trying to help uh, other countries like, you know, to, to advance in terms of innovation and culture. But by the picture, you can see like it's a major concern. Uh, here in Canada, we are so blessed, so fortunate to, to be able, like, you know, despite high prices and so on, you are managing. But other countries are far from worse. Uh, according to United Nations, again, with the world population, like uh, keep, on, keep on going, the food crisis has three main components. Uh, lifestyle incomes. In Canada, again, we are fortunate. Social organizations, our political, political environment is more stabilized. We are not up and down like some of the countries. Uh, you can see Peru, for example. You can see some of the African countries. There's no stability. Second, you have technology. Lots of research is being done in Canada, in North America, by USDA, by Ag Canada, to be sure that technology uh, helps us out in terms of innovation, how we can do things better. And third is inequality. Inequality is a big issue. We don't pay much attention. But there are many people, especially like in Canada, they come and you come to a new country, you're always at a different stage, lots of things to learn. And now you're faced with high cost of living and so on. Like, you know, it's a lot to digest. It brings lots of social issues, uh, but we don't realize. Uh, here we talk as a natural scientist, you know, whether it's agriculture, environment, it's all connected. Uh, we talk only about a as a natural scientist, but we don't think about the social issues that have on people, the impact it has on people and all of us. I mean, we talk a lot about people that arrive, but what about students in Canada? Whether well, like, you know, it's you, the young students, you know, it's pretty tough right now just to get by with high cost of everything, right? So those are like some of the uh, equations, but how do we get it better? Like, like, you know, whether government has to come with better policies to really help all of us. So the food crisis, again, uh, with Russia invasion, but of course there was uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, which really like, you know, in, so it was a initiation for higher prices. And uh, of course, after that, we thought we were getting better. We have a Russian invasion or occupation of Ukraine. And the reason it's, it's that important because Ukraine was a major producer of grain and so on. Now, with the war, it's like difficult for themselves to like to get by. Uh, for those people living in remote communities, it was already hard uh, to afford food. And now with uh, the high inflation costs, all what's happening, it makes it way, way harder. I, put, I, I took that from a thesis from a student two years ago from U of A, uh, where we almost see like food insecurity in households. And this was talking about the no, but now I think with high inflation, you still feel like a sense of homes and food insecurity because you have to be careful what you pick. Uh, waste less food, right? There are certain foods maybe you want to have, you cannot afford to buy. So how does that affect your nutrition? So we start to think about that. Uh, at the beginning, I totally, I don't know if I mentioned it, I think about the, when I think about agriculture, there is the subsistence agriculture, where like in the old days, people were like, like the family farm, this is how it started, but then there's commercial agriculture, right? So nowadays, like with high inflation and so on, maybe we are more becoming, we as a person, individual, we are becoming more and more like a subsistence, you know, like where we cannot enjoy the, you want to enjoy because if you put more food, it takes from something else, right? You only have so much income. So, most of the challenges we're facing today, uh, food sovereignty was boosted during the COVID 19. You start to see people uh, it's like go to the store, buy some pots, some, some soil, and start to do their own food. You see that's more common. It gives rise to like individual balcony gardening, uh, 
community garden in women's quality to start our community gardens and encourage people to grow. And it was a good thing. And we still see that today where uh, communities of the municipalities, like please make more land available so that people can come, have a little plot, they can grow their own vegetable. So this is a good thing. Uh, the whole idea of like, uh, the, when you talk about food uh, sovereignty, you will hear from many indigenous communities when we talk about food sovereignty, like having food to be able to eat is a right. Uh, you should not commoditize food, you know, where people use food as a bargain. Yes, you have to buy food, but don't just keep on checking the price up, you know, you use it as a bargain thing. So when you talk about food sovereignty, it has about seven pillars. One is to focus food on people, like people should be able to have plenty of food to eat. Uh, we should have knowledge and skill, the intentional skill, how to like grow food and pass it to future generations. We should not contaminate the local food system. Uh, be careful what, what you, how you go about growing food. Uh, work with nature. And I think this way, when I talk about the indigenous way of farming, uh, where we have uh, each crop uh, from uh, supporting each other. Nowadays, if you want a new word for that, that's called companion cropping. And this is very common, like we're using orchard. You have trees growing, like almond growing in, on the bottom, you get like, you know, uh, grasses, forage for sheep, browsing animals and so on, right? So, so you have cover cropping where you have one crop on one side, where you have another row of another crop to protect the soils, to support that crop or have uh, like a cover crop where you have, a, after you harvest, you put a field of peas and then like, you know, by fall time, you just throw it under. And by decomposition, we put that organic matter and this way you reduce the uh, nitrogen fertilizer use and so on. Uh, you think about values it provided, like mental health wise. You know, the the thing that to be able to grow uh, something by bed and to many people say, oh, I, I may not know how to grow. It's a challenge, but the satisfaction you get from growing, for example, some tomatoes, right? It's good for your mental wellness and so on. And also like food, food system. Think about where your food come from, uh, the distance that goes in, the cost, the, the whole footprint of where the food originates, right? Think of all of that. But we have about seven pillars of the food sovereignty. And also like the industry people like to call food is sacred. And, and the food is sacred in fact, because all of us need food in order to survive, to live, right? So we need that. So think about the greatest challenge facing us today. Uh, we keep on hearing climate change. I mean, the other one, things we can manage, the climate, how do we manage it? Think of even in BC a couple of years ago, where we have major flood in the valley and the river flooded, farm flooded, animals drowned, and the price of food went up. So how do we prevent such climate disaster from happening? Whether it's from too much rain or you have a severe drought where not enough rain. So what are some of the things we can do? You know, that, but the, uh, this even doesn't repeat itself. I mean, you better prepare us, right? So it's huge. And climate change is a huge subject nowadays from the COP27, the biodiversity conference we had in Montreal just a few months ago. We talk about uh, climate and loss of biodiversity, loss of pollinating insects. Uh, soils become more dry in certain places and certain regions soils become more wet. So we need to have crops that can grow in these weather. So these are very important because when we have reduced yield, how do we support a growing population? So we have to prepare how to better ourselves and to stop those catastrophic events uh, from affecting, impacting us. So some of the things like, you know, where was the festival? Uh, we put down like uh, perennial crops. Some of the perennial crops like in pastures and so on were cattle grazed. They got deep roots of a one meter, two meter deep. Some are even up deeper than trees and they sequester a higher rate of carbon. In fact, if you go into some of those pasture land, you look at the soil, you put a shovel there, you can the top layer that's really, really black, that's organic matter. 
and as you go down, when you get to the patent material, that this way the crops grow, it's very healthy, you get the microbes and so on, keeping the ecosystem healthy. You get cattle grazing, uh, animals browsing, wildlife and so on. Very, very healthy in terms of stabilizing the soil and keeping it productive. So I talk about cover crops, you know, like cover crops were used right in the, like, you know, right after the dust bowl to stabilize and the soil and let the soil grow. Because soil is dynamic, you know, it has lots of microbial life and uh, it helps to, to prepare the soils against climate, any climate impact. So cover crops help to do that. So biochar is getting attention, but if biochar goes back into Amazon rainforest, where you see uh, Amazonian burning wood to create biochar, and then that will tie up material, tie up like, you know, like uh, nutrients and so on, so they can grow crops. So very good technology, suddenly now, from 2,000 years ago, that biochar is getting attention. About 20 years ago, we did lots of research on biochar. Because so biochar, you can use different feed stuff, different materials. We we'll use trees, we we'll use grasses, and of course, trees, wood, branches, and so on. You get, you get the best biochar compared to grasses, because grasses is more, have more access. Uh, so that's why. But the practice goes back to 2000 years ago. And now we are trying to say, oh, we better go back, do more research, right? Uh, agroforestry, which was agroforestry, like, you know, people used to grow trees for fuel, because they need wood, you need to cook. And for fuel, you need trees for housing, for shelter. So you can have it in mixed plantation. And this way, regenerative agriculture comes into play. Look at your land, look at its position on the landscape, and how can you make best of from pasture to field crops to trees to better protect yourself from change in the climate. All right, think of these. So, when you think of a grand scheme, like, you know, we talk about green revolution, some people nowadays say it's time we, do, we bring back a second green revolution. But this second green revolution is not like, you know, let's tear down everything and grow crops. This is more about, like, you know, like investment. Investment not for us into the agricultural farm, helping families into programs, into innovation, but also to help other countries. Other countries where we don't have like enough knowledge, where things have been disastrous, the landscape, which allowed like, for example, like Northern Africa and so on, like, and people have been migrating because the land cannot support the people, there's no health, no wildlife, so people keep migrating. So now we are also investing, like, you know, how do we meet the sustainable development goal uh, brought up by the UN? And many of you may be aware, but in case you don't, those are United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. There are 17 of them. And among those 17 goals is, is education, there is landscape restoration, there is like agriculture, like, you know, like uh, uh, defeating hunger uh, to be sure that everybody has food. So do check into that if you're not familiar. And us in Canada, how are we, what are we doing? And of course, our government have a program, financial instruments. Uh, to better help farmers, look, small farmers, big farmers, and so on, to prepare them against change in prices, change in terms of uh, disastrous effects, so they will still have money to carry on. So this is from the Government of Canada website. The link is just so huge when you copy it. So I don't know how to copy a smaller link. I have no idea, but I thought I need to put the full address. But, uh, I call it building resiliency because the whole idea, like we won't be able to, to change the environment. What's going to happen in the environment will happen. But how do we prepare ourselves? How do we change our way, our lifestyle to make us better prepared uh, from a federal government? So from a provincial government, you know, local government, what are we doing? We, in fact, just uh, today, today, no, a couple of days ago, Alberta government announced program, you know, like, and every now and then you see those, those new, uh, new releases that more, more and more investment are going to communities to help them better prepare uh, against high prices, against disastrous uh, events. So this way our farmers who are very vital to this economy, 
uh, very important in ensuring that we are food in terms of grain, you know, can, can do the business we do and for us to have the food we want. So innovation, innovation goes a long way. Uh, when I think of innovation, I think of uh, I'm not sure Canada, because we are, we are one of the biggest. Uh, the experimental farm in Ottawa was one of the very first agricultural stations in Canada. Uh, I had the pleasure to visit that. I visited the B Village uh, Ag Station, which is one of the oldest, I think the second oldest. There's the one in Breville, which closed because it's a small museum now, uh, that one. And of course, there's Lacan, Lacombe in Alberta. Uh, it was a lot of scale, a lot of volume. Uh, nowadays, like in Bali, not only for feed, but you know, for the, even for our covered beverages, like molting barley. You know, if we don't have more good molting barley, we don't get our beer, right? Our beverage. So, lots of research in Lacombe going on. So, Ag Canada invests a lot of money into ensuring that like, research are done to help the farmers. In the past, farmers were just when the settlers came and so on, we were just trying by error at what was best for them. Today, with many of the innovation and the research, we can de-risk, de-risk those uh, uncertainties that farmers were facing, the challenges that farmers were facing by doing research. So we, can, we know what works and then take it to the farm and show them how it works. So some of these I talk about, like, you know, from the composition of plastics, how we, how we go about it, by looking at nutrient cycling, uh, look at pest and disease control, very important. Like, you know, before we just use herbicides with more persistent chemicals and so on. So now when you look at uh, the pyramid of things, when before using a herbicide, okay, do I have to use that herbicide? Yes or no? What are my alternatives? And I use an integrated approach, like you know, like maybe mowing, pulling by hand. So what else can, can I do? Like you know, put a cover crop around it and then mow it. So look at all the approach, and if your herbicide becomes sort of a tough thing, so nothing else, then maybe this I can use, right? But in the past, we could just go use the herbicide, right? So now you look at it as a integrative approach to the problem. So. Soil structure and stability is very important. Like, you know, if you don't conserve organic matter, the soil will just become crumbled, it will dry out. When it become uh, dry, again, it's dry out. There will, there will be less microbial life. So lots of research going to that. We look at stable carbon sequestration. I think I put carbon sequestration twice. The reason we put stable, the difference here. When you look at carbon sequestration, the leaves fall down. Uh, when you plant trees and so on, it's super set carbon. But then when the leaves fall down and so on, that carbon gets decomposed and really stuck into the environment. So stable ca carbon is carbon that's piled down to the ground. Even 1,000 years from now, the carbon is still there. Huge difference. Many people nowadays when talk about climate change, oh, let's plant trees, great, you know? But when the leaves fall down and so on, the carbon gets really back to the environment. So, it's important to be sure uh, prior to jumping on the bandwagon to see what fit for, right? What's working well. So stable carbon like grass and where I show you the rules for the early day of and this the kind of carbon to use biochar or even in planting and so on, to tie tie down the carbon for years and years. So lots of research going on. And of course we talk about regenerative agriculture. Uh, this one, I, I did some courses from them. I follow them a lot. Uh, we have a newsletter. We are out of Netherlands. And if you look countries like Netherlands, uh, Israel, even Saudi Arabia, you can learn a lot about food production because there we, it's dry all the time. Like in Netherlands, it's wet and small space. How do you grow lots of crops, right? To feed a growing population. In countries like Israel and Saudi Arabia, it's very dry. So what is important, and as we all of us know, what is 70 plus percent in all our body? So where do we get water to do crops, to feed animals and so on? So me as a researcher, I mean, I look at countries like Australia, 
Saudi Arabia, Israel, what are we doing? Because that's very dry. What can we learn from them? Uh, don't excuse the ones that put better prepared. So like today we are talking about biochar, what was ever sequestration. 20, 20, 25 years ago, I did a paper on carbon sequestration on grassland for government of Alberta. We have a document, we read it, we put it in the structure. Nobody does anything with it. I did the research on feedstock uh, for biofuel. Nobody looked at it. Today we are clearing up the palm trees and so on. No, clearing up the forest to plant more palm for bio oil. And uh, so I was always about 20 years, 25 years ahead of the times. And I said, wow, I wish I go back to I go back to work again. But I don't I don't want to. I thought I should enjoy it. But anyway, leave that there. Um, but uh, this is how we are preparing, you know, like a lot of work, you know, like I think here, like, you know, when you look at the organization doing the search, there's a lot. I put some of the top one I just took from Google, but there are also colleges like old college uh, doing the search. Uh, and to add innovation, how to better monitor looking at other the soil to really map your soil and know like each uh, area so we saw where you need more fertilizer. You can even map the plants, how much nutrients you need and how much you need to add. So before you just take your fertilizer, put into a helper, just drive up and down the field and spread your fertilizer. Now, by sampling your field, knowing what the nutrients are and which areas of the soil need Fertilizer, you can map it more accurately to make more effective use of those nutrients, more effective use of fertilizer. And at the same time, when you do that, you cut down your source, right? So, there are different ways. Uh, boy, we need two. One of us, okay. Uh, now, us as a people, we, we also have a responsibility. Uh, we have a challenge that, you know, like many people tend to break down because, hey, you know what, it's better for the planet. So, is vegan really better? I don't know, but that's a choice you make, right? But it's okay, that's your choice. Uh, there's also organic, is organic better than traditional agriculture? That's a choice you have to do, and also price affects all of that. Um, how does one decide? How do you make, how do you decide? Is this only a money factor or there's over, there are other factors that help your decision making? For example, like, you know, greenhouse emissions. Uh, think like, you know, in terms of the uh, footprint, where the crops come from, uh, what's, the, what's the greenhouse uh, emission from that? Uh, think about water use. Some plants say like, hey, this is too, I will not, I will not drink uh, this uh, milk, for example, because it's too much water, but I'll take the soil because soil uses less water to grow, right? So some people decide to make those choices. But you can also look at nutrient pollution. Some stuff that you just plant them, over like, you know, use a lot of fertilizer, herbicide, and so on to manage that crop. And look at habitat disturbances, you know, how a uh, crop or whatever come about. Those will help you to make that decision. You know, it's a, it's a matter of choice, right? How you go about your way of life. Uh, I talk about that, where our food comes from. And many of us, if you go to a shop, we just buy it. But many of us say, you know what? In the winter, I'll buy them, but in the summer, I'll grow my own, and then I will have tomatoes for the next four months. Uh, Jay, yes, sorry, I hate to interrupt, but we usually leave around 10 minutes for questions, and we have a hard stop oh. today at 2 30. So, sure. if there's any chance, you could just uh yeah. just wrap up the slides quick, and then we can get to a few questions here before sure. we have to go. And also, like, think about adding diversity to our crop, you know, like you know, rather than just like cereals, look at some of the instant grain. You got like, some of the pulses were very nutritious and not how to cook on them. We talk about how to secure the future, like, you know, by having seed and uh, conservation, like the one in uh, Norway. So, to be sure, in terms of the disaster, we still have seeds where you can take for planting to have, to have food again. Uh, building soil fertility is very important, like composting, organic matter, and so on. And of course, uh, getting youth involved, you know. Youth involved from an early age, like nowadays you have programs in schools uh, showing kids how to grow crops, vegetables, and so on, and make them become more, more grounded, right? And uh, of course, I talk about vegetative agriculture, I want to talk about it. Jump to summary. Uh, summary, as you can see, like uh, no one plans to go in a stomach. I like eating, and if you're like me, 
we like eating light. So we can strengthen the country. How we can strengthen the country? Food security. Uh, bear in mind the road to net zero because the government's coming up, you know, we got to move towards net zero. But how do we do that by having maybe we grow food more locally? Uh, me, but what I like is the wellness, the mental wellness, you know, to keep us together. Uh, what do we learn from the past? Uh, I told you about the Green Revolution, the Dust Bowl, and some of the policies of the past that really impacted us, you know, and how do we train our practices to be sure that, you know, climate change will still be here for us. So with that, I talk again about, I started with commercial versus subsistence, you know, from the beginning. We have high prices, the way things are going nowadays, and hopefully the policies will change. Uh, we understand things better, and it won't affect us as bad. We can enjoy the good things that we have been blessed with in this country. Uh, I put this slide here just from the Aboriginal thing, that you know, just to show that it's all connected. Whether you're talking about oil and gas, you're talking about energy, you're talking about uh, agriculture, and taking care of the land, it's the world in terms of it's all collected. Anything out of balance will will suffer, right? We want to say thank you to all for having me. You guys have been wonderful. So my contact information is there. And of course, I put some acknowledgement, but I took lots of, you know, my thing from the web, from magazine, or go to the museum and take pictures or to the, in the store to take pictures. So, so that's why I say thank you to all. So open to questions. Thank you.